just thank you again and uh, let her rip, Taylor. Give us some metaphor. All right. Um, if, like me, you had a well meaning English teacher who told you that a metaphor was a way of comparing two things, then your teacher was no better than mine. It wasn't until I uh, came up with the idea for metaphor dice that I realized that's a terrible description of what a metaphor is. A metaphor is not a way of comparing two things. A metaphor is a way of speaking in a secret code that you want everybody to be able to break. A way of saying, not that I'm going to be comparing these two things, I'm going to say this thing is this other thing. And now I can talk about them interchangeably. Uh, a metaphor is every human culture the world over has developed some kind of figurative language to help us talk about the things that are hard to understand, the big things, the concepts, the ideas, the heavy things, love, death, uh, loyalty, childhood. Uh, these things are hard to explain either because they are so big and hard to wrap your brain around or else they have been talked about and talked about to death and it's hard to talk about them in a fresh way. But, a, but, but metaphor is useful for saying, you know, for the purposes of this poem, let me say that this big thing equals this small thing. In 1998, I lived in a large building in New York City and my neighbors knew that I was a poet and they asked me to write a love poem for their wedding. And love is one of those things that's hard to talk about. So I needed, I needed an entry point, a way in. I needed a window into their, into their love life so that I could uh, talk about it to write the, the poem in celebration of their wedding, which is, by the way, an epithalamian Greek term, which means a poem in celebration or uh, honor of a certain wedding, an epithalamian. So they had just recently bought a dog and I would see the dog in the hallways. And so I used that as my entry point. And I started writing this poem called How Falling in Love is Like Owning a Dog. And it's uh, it, once you have a sort of the subject is the title, then it just became a list poem. These are all the different ways in which falling in love, which is hard to talk about because it's a big concept, is like owning a dog, something smaller, more manageable. Um, that poem was not written uh, using metaphor dice, predated metaphor dice by 20 years, but it totally could have been, um, except that it's uh, falling in love is like owning a dog is a simile. So maybe I have to invent simile dice. Two of my favorite metaphors in English poetry are Yeats. He talks about in one of his poems, the rag and bone shop of the heart. The heart is a rag and bone shop. The rag and bone shop of the heart. Or Mary Oliver's Wild Geese, where she says, you do not have to be good. You do not have to drag yourself on your hands and knees through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. All right, that is a metaphor. The body is a soft animal. Uh, the soft animal of your body. This metaphor dice was born out of 20 years of teaching poetry workshops, often to kids who don't really want to be there. And once I had this girl in class who was sitting there, not really engaged in class, and she was, had her hands crossed over her chest. And, and I said, why aren't, you, uh, why aren't you partaking in the class? And she said, well, I'm really a maths person. And I found myself saying, and I don't know where this came from, Oh, well, that's okay, because a metaphor is an equation between two words, usually a big one and a small one. Her eyes lit up because I was using her language. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an equation between a concept and an object with maybe a variable thrown in as a, as a uh, with maybe an adjective thrown in as 
uh, three words from the board, you know, and I'd, we'd all put these words on the board, a list of big things that are hard to talk about, smaller thing, concrete. You could say abstract nouns, adjectives, and concrete nouns. And she said, I, I picked three for her. I said, what about my father is a broken mirror? All right. Now that's a metaphor because you don't mean that literally. Everybody who hears that would know that you mean that figuratively. My father is a broken mirror. Now your job in a poet, in a poem, would be to just write a few lines explicating that. Use the phrase, which is to say. And she said, wait, I, I think I can do that. And I said, uh, okay, give it a shot. And she said, my father is a broken mirror, which is to say, he's been shattered into a thousand pieces. He's hard to handle without cutting yourself. My mother says he is seven years of bad luck, but even in the smallest, sharpest, sharpest shards, I can still recognize my own reflection. Now that's the origin story of Metaphor Dice. I tell it all the time. It may or may not have happened exactly like that, but it makes a good story. Um, so what we're gonna do to today is I'm gonna roll some of the dice. I've got them here. And now, now the set that I'm using, I've got my, I've got my red dice, my blue dice, and, uh, and the white dice. And I've used, um, a, I've used two different sets. The original uh, Metaphor Dice starter set, which was 12 dice, and then the set that came out last year, which is called the Erudite Expansion set. Um, and that's where the, it's only nine dice, the words are, slightly bigger, slightly more challenging. Um, incidentally, it, somebody put in the, a link in the, in the chat that although the best deals that you can have on buying Metaphor Dice are, can be had at metaphordice.com, um, I, I still fulfill the orders. And so the, unfortunately, uh, if you want a set of these by Friday, you, can, you should probably just order them off Amazon. So um, some of the big dice say, uh, thank you, Renee. That was incredibly quick. Um, my family is, my demise will be, uh, some part of me craves, you'll see that. These come from, I, know, I happen to remember this dice comes from the Erudite expansion. I don't remember what was under this side, but I, can everybody read that? Can you read that, Sam? Oh, he's been muted. It says <laughs> social distancing. Yeah. social distancing. So a couple of these, you'll see that I've replaced them with some more topical uh, topical words. Now, I'm going to roll the reds. And um, Renee, I want you to take everybody off mute. Uh, and they'll, I want you to call out. I'm going to, I hopefully you'll be able to see the, the dice. And um, I want to be able to hear people say, oh, I want to write about that. I want to write about that. I'm going to choose two reds. Then we're going to do blues, and then we're going to do the whites, and we're going to come up with um, six six dice. And we'll, we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that. But you're going to write when I send you off back to your group to your to your separate groups, and you're going to be in the same groups where you did the little uh, get to know you chat. Um, we're gonna we're you're all going to write a couple of lines explaining that metaphor. And I want every one of your lines to begin with either, which is to say, or because. Now, here's an example, um, not to put the pressure on you, but here's an example that three seventh grade girls uh, <laughs> wrote when they rolled the phrase, my mother is a rugged blessing. They wrote for about 20 minutes, and then they came back and they rehearsed it. They came up with an let's read last and then we'll do this one first and we'll do that one that 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 and then oh hey that last one let's all read it together here it is um they rolled my mother is a rugged blessing they gave it a title which is calloused hands praying my mother is a rugged blessing which is to say sometimes she hugs me so hard it hurts and sometimes she curses even when she is praying, or rather she prays in the middle of scolding me, which is to say her love is not fragile, which is to say 
No matter how loudly I slam my bedroom door in anger, nothing can silence the prayers that stream from her eyes like tears. So I'm gonna send you off after we choose the six words. Now with six words, and I'll say this again, You'll have, you know, you and all the groups could choose one of the two reds, one of the two whites, and one of the two blues to create a different metaphor. And I believe, if my math is correct, that the opt the number of, of uh, different unique metaphors that you could get from six dice, two of each color, is going to be two times two times two. There are going to be eight different metaphors. The first thing you're gonna do as a group is discuss the possibilities. Say, oh, I'd like to do that. Land on a metaphor. We might end up with, with eight different possibilities. We might end up with five, there are five groups, is that right? Yes. You might end up with, we might end up with five slightly different metaphors, which will be wonderful. Um, and then towards the end of this class, we're gonna, you'll, we'll come back and we'll listen to your uh, group poems. But now it's time to uh, to pick the metaphors. So let me show you my setup here. I'm in Connecticut, and uh, in in at my old my family's old. Uh, this is the this is my parents' master bedroom. What town, uh, Taylor? Where in what's Connecticut? That? Where, what town in Connecticut? I am in uh, Norfolk, Connecticut. Oh wow! I grew up in Connecticut. So I am. Where <laughs> where where are you? I grew up in Vernon. No, I'm in the city now. I'm in Washington Heights, but I grew up in Connecticut and I know the whole, all the towns. <laughs> oh, got it. Got it. Well, I know all the towns because I've been checking the Connecticut coronavirus town by town. Oh, yeah. Count. Big time. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, reverse this and show you that. Uh, is that reverse? Oh, I don't know what you can see about. They call Norfolk the icebox of Connecticut. Yeah. And that's because it is snowing again outside right now. It snowed two days. All right. Um, I was looking, this is my little setup, uh, and I was looking, this is my, my uh, magnetic NATO mount, and it enables me to hold my camera in any position, and I needed, I tried to use this light to attach my camera to, but I found this, this is a hundred year old cobbler's um, helper. Wow. It, oh, wow. Uh, nice. It's iron, so that the, listen to this. Strong. <laughs> I mean, that, that sticks to that pretty, pretty thoroughly. Okay, so I'm going to try to. All right, here are the reds. If I hold like that, can everybody see it? Yes. Okay, all right, I'm going to roll them. And uh, everybody is muted. So we've got your mother, the past, shame, hope, my lungs or the shadow yell out yell out the one that you don't want shame shame nobody wants I don't to want write shame either shame. nobody oh gosh, wants to write that. about shame okay i'm going to set no. that aside um you want to choose my lungs no no okay right. nobody wants to write about my lungs all right no i want the lungs i want the lungs I want shame and the lungs. No? Okay. <laughs> oh, no, no. oh, my poor lungs. Shame on my lungs. The toughest uh, ones are the best. The, 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 the ones that I should say, I once did a yoga class. Wait, let me let me see if I can point this. Uh, is this a weird shot? <laughs> <laughs> I once, oh, you know, once I was doing a, um, in the in the gym at the bottom of my apartment in Brooklyn, we've got this uh, device called a Roman chair. It's good if you have a bad back. It basically allows you to sort of hang upside down from the waist, and you can do these re reverse sit-ups like that. <laughs> and uh, I have an iPhone 11, so it's got uh, Face ID, and I was I was I was hanging upside down. And I, I, I tried to open my phone, and my phone was like, you are not Taylor Mullen. That is not <laughs> Taylor Mullen. Like, so, I mean, it was just like the blood was running into my cheeks and stuff like that. All right. Um, okay. Of, of, of what is here, your mother, Hope. Uh, oops, you're, you're still looking at my face. Um, <laughs> of what is here? Hope. Um, I, ch I choose shadow. I choose shadow. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. There's a lot of people who've chosen the shadow. So, about hope? 
I'm going to do um, the chef. I'm going to use teacher's privilege. And so the two things that you guys are going to be writing about are either the shadow or my lungs. Go ahead and make a, you can make a note of it. Um, I'm going to give you a shot of that later. What, what is the shadow? What are your lungs? Here are the blues. These are the things you'll be describing them to. Okay, is the are my lungs a virus? No. Oh, are my lungs a songbird, a zoo, a tyrant, an animal, a frailty, a wedding gown? Hmm. Yell out what you like. Let me hear some things that you like. I like virus. them all. Wedding gown. <laughs> frailty. Frailty. A frailty. Right. Wedding gown. Wedding, yeah, wedding gown. All right. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Okay, so either we've got, let me show you what we've got so far. Either we've got the shadow is a wedding gown or my lungs are a type of frailty or my lungs are a wedding gown or the shadow is a type of frailty. But now, but what kind? What kind? Here are the adjectives. My wedding gown is a shadow. What's that? Can you do it the other way around? My you, wedding gown is a shadow? You absolutely, your name, I can't, uh, it's hard. Oh, Rachel. Rachel. Um, you absolutely could do the wedding gown as a shadow. Um, I'm going to give you that weird look of, of me. <laughs> um, you could do that, but the shadow is the, is the, is the, broader, the broader noun. And it's, it, that is what you would need to, that is what you would need to, well, you know what? I don't, I don't know your life. It, and of course, Anything, if, if the dice send you to the paper to, to give you 10 minutes of, of, uh, of juicy things to write about, then, then that is, then they have succeeded. So, um, you know, when kids r roll, um, you know, my, my mother is a rugged blessing. They go, uh, no, she's not. You know, she's not rugged. I'm like, great. You don't have, you know, do we have to do this? The, one of the best things to hear when a kid says, oh, wait. Do I have to write that? Because I think I got a better idea. She's like, oh, by all means, by all means, if you have a better idea, write about that. So if um, when you get when you get punched into your group, sorry, that's a horrible, <laughs> horrible um, verb to use. But when you find yourself in your group, you know, by all means, pitch it, pitch it to the rest of the group. Hey, how about we write the wedding gown as a shadow? Or maybe that could just be one of your lines, right? The shadow. The shadow is a last minute. I'm just stealing one of the one of the adjectives. The shadow is a last minute wedding gown, which is to say, not a shotgun wedding, but where your mother is a seamstress and you would not have to walk down the aisle naked. Or maybe the wedding gown is a shadow. You stand in the shadow of your great grandmother. You know, whatever. If you if it gets you going, use it. You could turn it into one one line. Okay. Okay. What type of wedding gown? What type of frailty? Here come, here come the adjectives. Wait, I still have to. Let's just switch you around. Okay. All right. Is it non-negotiable? Is it a midnight? Is it now? Notice that's midnight, midnight as an adjective. Feckless obviously comes from the uh, the erudite set. Is it a desperate wedding gown? Gentle, flawed, or unruly? I'm going to use my teacher. Um, I'm going to use my teacher privilege and say that one of the adjectives you will be using is flawed. You will see that later. Uh, let me hear. See, Rachel, you were the one who said, hey, what about this if we went around backwards? Um, so I'm going to let you choose. What do you want? Unruly. Can you see unruly, even though it's upside down? Uh, I love unruly. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. Let me, um, let me create the picture for you. <clears throat> this might take a moment. Well, while Taylor is doing that, here's a reminder, I think, of what he will want you to do is that as you get back into your groups, you will hash out which of these you will use, one blue, one red, one blue, one white. So as a group, you'll make this, you'll make a collective choice. You'll each write a few lines, two or three. They will each begin with uh, because, or which is to say, and then Taylor, you'll go from there. Okay. Can everybody see that? Mm -hmm. 
All right. So, so before you go into your groups, um, make a make a little note of what the what the six choices are. And you know that 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 bottom one is, says my lungs. It's a little hard for me to see just because of the angle. Um, and then, um, so when you when you go into your groups, and I figure everybody's got it now. When you go into your groups, the first thing you're going to want to do is decide what your metaphor is going to be as a, as a group. Um, discuss the options. Rachel, if you really want to go back, you you know you can always whatever the whatever the group says they want to do, you know that you're you're it's a free country for another couple of months at least. Um, you're you're free to say you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna change it I'm gonna do it my own way. Um, and then once you once you've got that once you've got the metaphor, um, and I think. Uh, uh, Renee, let's let's give people uh, ten minutes, and I will duck into each room um, after after five minutes and check on how how everybody's going. So there's going to be five minutes of quiet writing where I want you to get at least uh, two lines, two completely different lines. Yeah, I'm really great. And then as you um, uh, um, after you share with each other, um, come up with an order, and I think it I, my own sense as a former slam poet is that you shouldn't um if you've got five people who have each written two lines that begin with either because or which is to say no one person should say their two lines back to back so we're going to jump around when we finally get back together at the end of the class for the group performance which is going to be great then we say okay uh group number renee will figure out how to call on you guys i don't know how that's going to work but um uh you know we'll we'll be jumping back and forth if there are five people and 10 lines we're going to see the camera change 10 times i can give you my tips about reading slow you know there are three tips about reading poetry and that is read louder than you think necessary slower than you think necessary and clearer than you think necessary the, the world is starved for everyone to speak a little louder and a lot slower. When you realize how slow the world will let you speak without thinking you're stupid, you're the only one who thinks you're stupid for speaking this slowly. The rest of the world is grateful for it. Are there any questions? Um, can you, you wanna raise your hand or maybe you can shout out. But Taylor. Or Taylor, you you want us to um, to order them, but then we're going to be reciting them not in that order. How many, Sam? How many do you think? Are you sounds like you've already started writing. No, you I, think you I, could get three out of this? No, I just I just want to know what we're supposed to what what the task is in terms of the group. When you get off into your group, you decide on the metaphor. You write at least two lines. If you write more than three, choose your best three. All right. If all, if everybody in the group wrote three, that's going to be 15 lines. That is long enough. So if you write 10, just cross out the seven worst ones and only read the top three. Um, but then the, the order in which ideas come to you is rarely the order in which they should be presented in a poem. Sometimes the the best idea that comes to you uh, is going to come to you first, but I'll, it shouldn't be. If you put it first in the poem, it would be wasted. I can tell you, the girls who wrote Calloused Hands Praying, that last line is, uh, no matter how loudly I slam my bedroom door in anger, nothing can silence the prayers that stream from her eyes like tears. The girl who wrote that line said that was the line that she that she came up with first. The group said, yeah, be that as it may, that line is so good, it needs to be last. That will be the end of our group poem. And it's so good, we're all going to say it with you like we get some of the credit. Taylor, just to else. clarify, if I could ask a clarifying, um, it sounds like what we're doing then is we're going to get with our group and first decide on our metaphor that the group is going to do. Second, we're going to do some individual writing. I'm um, not Correct. sure how much time that is. And then come back to the group 
to do like an editing slash organ orchestration type thing. Is that true? That is correct. Yeah. How, when, how I much mean, time total do we have? I think it's ten. Um, when I think we, I think we'd better we better make it fifteen since there okay. are three distinct tasks to do. Okay. And I'll All check. Right. I, I mean, I'll check in with Perfect. every group Thank and you. see how it's going. <laughs> Except if I if I check in with the group and I hear everybody's working quietly, I'll just leave and I'll come <laughs> back. Um, I think there was one person who tried to ask a question, and now is your opportunity. They say that teachers never wait long enough to see if anyone <laughs> has a question. Audrey, Audrey uh, does. I have a question. In terms of the technology, is there a way, um, can we, I forget, it's been a while since I've used Zoom now. Um, is there a way that we can do like a screen share within our group so that somebody can type the lines out and then reorder them? Or, or we just, should we just keep it in handwriting on a pad? I would keep it in handwriting on a pad. I, I, I bet we could waste the rest of this uh, class trying to look for a technical solution for, uh, you know, the story of the, um, the, the Americans spent millions of dollars trying to develop a pen that would work in outer space and the Russians just used a pencil. <laughs> I think we're going to have to be a little Russian on this, this one. Great. Uh, any other clarifications or shall we send you off? Do it. All right, let's do it. We'll see you back in 15 minutes. Good luck, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Taylor. It's good. Hello, live stream audience. I forgot that this is also uh, being, you know, broadcast for all time. Here we are on April 21st of 2020. If you've forgotten, we're in the middle of a uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic, and so. Believe it or not, uh, this is like the height of technology. These are all teachers who have, are, are really trying their best to get a handle on uh, distance learning, not distance learning, distance teaching. Um, I've spoken to a lot of friends of mine who are teachers and the first thing they have to do is sort of relearn this, how to do this. Uh, and then, and now we're, uh, and now we're doing the best. I think my, I suspect my son's preschool class is going to get canceled for the rest of the year. Um, this is probably going to live on the internet for longer than, and you know, than all of us. Uh, and uh, I imagine that you know, if you are looking back at this video from distant, long in the future, it will be hysterical how. Uh, choppy it is and how we didn't really know what we were doing and uh, but the truth is we don't know what we're doing and this is new to us and if it weren't for people like Rachel who's pulling the doing the levers and Renee who's managing all the groups uh, it would be uh, it would be even choppier than it is um, I gotta go now and check in on uh, some of the groups but um, I hope you are enjoying this and you of course can you don't have a group to help you, um, but you can write some of the lines yourself. And maybe, I guess, if this is on YouTube, in the comments, leave your own, leave your own poem that you wrote based on, the, but what would I do? I would do, um, my lungs are an unruly wedding gown. Um, and, and talk about, uh, you know what? I would use I would use both adjectives. My lungs are a flawed, uh, an unruly but flawed wedding gown, and talk about the how wedding gowns are, rarely fit. Um, they maybe fit you for one week and then they stop fitting you. I would talk about um, the necessity of heirlooms or something like that. Um, Renee, remind me when people come back if anybody chooses my law, my lungs are a flawed wedding gown. Um, uh, remind me to tell them that they get a gold star or something like that. Hi, group four. Do you guys know that you're actually group four? Yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> you can come up with your own. You can come up with a better name if you if you come up with one. Uh, when at the end of the uh, at the end of the class, when I say, and now let's hear from Group Four, you can say, "You mean the Avengers or whatever." Um, um, 
it sounds like you're quiet writing. What's the metaphor you're all writing on? Frailty is an unruly shadow. Okay. And that's our timer. Okay. Now it's time to share. Frailty is an unruly shadow. I look forward to hearing it. I'll be back later. Good luck, you guys. Thanks. Are we ready? I'm ready. Should we do both at once or do two rounds? Um, you mean both both of our lines at once? Yes. Uh, it doesn't matter. Is it going to be like for hearing purpose, like hearing the ideas? Is it going to be like more manageable to be creative if we just do because or which is to say? Mine are kind of connected. So I feel like if they are broken up, it might not work as much. It might okay. also, but um, I was kind of just flowing with it as I was going. Sure. Do you want to start? Yeah. Um, yeah, sure. Okay. God, I'm so nervous. Um, okay. No, don't be nervous. We're all good here. <laughs> all right. Okay. Can you write a shitty first me metaphor? You can do it. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So um, I did like two ish lines. So I said, frailty is an unruly shadow, which is to say, my bones will never heal that I am broken day or night, because even in the darkness, I can see my defects behind me, haunting me like an infected and impatient child. Mm. I like the haunted and infected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. Who wants to go next? All right, I'll go, I'll go. Um, so I did two separate ones. I'm like brainstorming. So um, frailty is an unruly shadow, which is to say it dwarfs all accomplishments, abandoning you and leaving you alone in desperation because it punctures your spirit, dislocating you from your center. That was another idea. I really like how... I'm sorry? I just really liked how you connected like frailty and this aloneness. Oh, thanks. Because it harps on you until your brokenness is all you see. Because it pesters and punctures your core, leaving it in tatters. Okay, I have frailty is an unruly shadow, which is to say that sometimes flopping is less effective than passing when there are seconds left in the quarter and someone else has a clear shot. Frailty is an unruly shadow, which is to say being seen through dark light might not keep you, your flaws any more hidden than black light keeps blood. Mm. I like that idea of like hiding. And, yeah, it's really, well, you that generated a lot of thoughts for me. <laughs> Um, I can go next. Um, I sort of changed the metaphor a tiny bit, but I don't know if it still works. We'll see. Um, I wrote frailty is the unruly shadow instead of frailty is an unruly shadow. Um, frailty is the unruly shadow of my endless optimism, which is to say even silver linings create shades of gray, which is to say positivity is a choice that escapes me now. Mm -hmm. Um, the lining part. Yeah. Like the shadows of the silver lining. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't write as many lines as you guys, but um, I wrote frailty is an unruly shadow because it's always escaping. It's specter is everywhere. Mm. I like specter. Mm, thanks. And I just like wrote a lot of, a lot of my, like I tried to play with, 
different things that I associate mm-hmm. with frailty. So a lot of my, what I wrote was just like, because, like figuring out if I like because, or which is to say better. Mm-hmm. All right. So I am going to mute <laughs> everyone for the time being and let you take over again, Taylor. Okay. Uh, for reasons that will become clear later, uh, four, five, and end with one. Um, and then, so we'll, we'll hear it. And uh, I'm going to try to keep myself from commenting because that's always what makes this too long. And I, I don't know what time it is, but I suspect we're running out of time. And my wife has been with our uh, two kids and I need to help, help her. Uh, so whatever happens at the end, I will probably um, uh, disappear. So, so, all right, group two. Did you guys come up with a code name? I'm taking it, I'm turning it over to you, group two. He told us our name was group two. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I don't know that we actually have an order. No, we don't. Oh, okay. All right. Well, then um, we'll just, then I, I, we'll, do you wing it. Wait, that's, what we were, that's what we Wait were thinking, it. just that. Okay, all right. All right, I'll start and then you guys can jump in. Um, so we have, the shadow is a flawed wedding gown, which is to say, it moves with you as you try to forget about it. Because even though it's not perfection, you can call it your own. Which is to say, it follows behind me, whether it is my wedding day or not, because it darkens the color beneath it. Because the beauty inside is hidden, which is to say the love is covered by an ill-fitting guise. Because I do not like the way it clings to others' expectations which is to say it's too holy. Which is to say it's hard to be seen when your imperfections are what is most obvious. Which is to say the flawed wedding gown casts a shadow, but what is important is the person who wears both, not the gown nor the shadow. That's it. Okay. <laughs> Good to see you. You also snap. do reactions at the bottom. There's little hand and reactions bottom right. You can just. It's go good down. to. Yeah, it's good. You can see. I can see on my speaker view. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah, now I get it. Uh, who wrote that line about being too holy? Nakomo. Nakomo. I love that line. And uh, which, I mean, I want you to. Are you. Uh, you're, of course, completely thinking about. Um, the holes that moths make as well. Mm-hmm. Making it, you know, that's a, there's a pun there that's fantastic. Okay, group three, we are all yours. I think you have to unmute yourself, Megan, no? I think Megan's first. Sorry, I forgot we were group three for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. My lungs are an unruly wedding gown, which is to say they began their life pristine. Crisp and delicate, I wore them down the street dodging coffee cups and smoke blown sideways out of the mouths of strangers. The phlegm, the cough, the dread. The soot of the cigarettes staining the fingers, the teeth, the walls. My lungs are an unruly wedding gown, which is to say that they stop and catch, not where the seamstress designed, but only at the worst time and place. Like when he said that, and I couldn't quiet him fast enough, and you heard, they heard, they all heard. Which is to say, I want to go back to taken for granted comfort. Well done, group three. 
Uh, I want to go back to taking for granted comfort as well. This old barn up in Litchfield County, um, with my parents bought it in 1968 and we moved in in 1969 when I was four years old. And so my siblings and I, my parents have passed, my siblings and I still come up here um, twice a year to like winterize it in the fall and to open it up for the summer in the spring. And last year, we decided to have a huge pizza party. There's a truck from New Haven that you can get, and it's a pizza truck, and it parked. Yeah, that's right. Uh, they, they they pulled up the, the it was not Pepe's I can't remember what the name of the the brick oven brick oven pizza and they pulled up the pizza truck right in front of the driveway and we had about a hundred people come to this party and at about eight thirty in the evening we all gathered and everybody told stories about the barn and about uh, my parents and okay okay yes but uh, the the natives are getting restless but I think back that was the last time I was in this barn. And I was sharing this barn with a hundred other people. And that just seems like such a luxury now, which is to say, group four, frailty is an unruly shadow. They switch things around. Group four, we are all yours. You want to come listen to a poem? Okay, come here. You go, Catherine. Okay, I'm first. Um, frailty is an unruly is an unruly shadow, which is to say my bones will never heal, that I am broken day or night, because even in the darkness, I can see my defects behind me, haunting me like an infected and impatient child. Frailty is an unruly shadow because it pesters and punctures your core, leaving it alone and in tatters. Which is to say, being seen through dark light might not keep your flaws any more hidden than black light keeps blood. Because frailty is the unruly shadow of my endless optimism, which is to say, even silver linings create shades of gray. Because frailty is an unruly shadow because it is always escaping its specter everywhere. Metaphor dice. <laughs> yeah, they wrote this. They all wrote this using metaphor dice. That group, you how many how often did you guys rehearse that? It was seemed so well rehearsed. Well done. Well done, group four. All right, groups five and one both chose the exact same metaphor. My lungs are an unruly wedding gown. Uh, let's start with group five and go straight into group one since you all your your lines should seamlessly blend together and if if group one accidentally uh jumps on the tail of group five it won't be a problem groups group 51. Can well, i just 15, remind group one what order we go in <laughs> group five has no order so uh, okay sounds like group one doesn't either you guys have more in common than you thought no we do i was going to remind them oh okay. <laughs> okay so it's elizabeth jess marissa me then anastasia i guess one of us has to go first do it will okay um, my lungs are an unruly wedding gown because they are meant for one task <laughs> and one task alone but they seem to get in the way of everything, you know, like running marathons and giving speeches and singing out of tune karaoke and drinking orange juice with a best friend without having it squirt out of my nose. Which is to say that it, in a moment, the moment when clarity and poise and eloquence really truly matter, I can't stop hiccuping. Which is to say that even though the silent stoic seamstress measured carefully, the first fitting was a failure because they couldn't collect enough air to shout loud enough, even though I begged them to breathe in deeply. My lungs are an unruly wedding gown, which is to say they sing out words that will not fit. Because they are where my attention lands, which is to say the easy place, the dress, not the marriage, lungs, not the fear. My lungs are an unruly wedding gown, 
just to say they fill with scent and air and something else because you have come in with your dress on shining which is to say my sweet wild child has disappeared my lungs are in an early wedding gown because i wake up still scared of the night when they tore to satin shreds that's it for group five Elizabeth? My lungs are an unruly wedding gown because the solemnity of vows is uttered in lacy billows of imperfection. Which is to say, my chest heaves with yearning for that past summer joy. Marissa. Did we lose her? Sorry. <laughs> um, I was muted. Um, either I ran too long this morning in the slipstream of your indifference, or my breath just has commitment issues. Hmm. Anastasia. Anastasia. Oh, here she is. I think she's muted. Yeah, she there she is. <laughs> My lungs are an unruly wedding gown, which is to say that they are dark with fear, with expectation, and they defy all rules. She's on mute. The end. The end. That's <laughs> great. That's great. Uh, very much like um, an exercise called an exquisite corpse, where you write uh, one line and then uh, you write two lines. You write one line, pass it on. Somebody reads just the first line and then writes a second line and you fold it over and you keep passing it around and everybody only gets to see the line right above. You think what you're writing is just a minor contribution, but then in the grand scheme of the larger piece, you realize, wait, this is actually so much better than I thought I could be. I think <laughs> I was contributing to such a work of genius. There are such great lines in there. Um, the, whoever the group was, I think it was one that managed to, to do an either or line split over two different people. Either I did this or yeah. else that. I loved that. Yeah. Um, I loved somebody had in the, the alliteration, um, there's a, uh, the silent stoic seamstress. I loved, I loved that. And then my, uh, there was a great line. Uh, <laughs> I mean the dress, I mean the dress, not the marriage. Uh, you don't have to have a set of metaphor dice to get people thinking figuratively in this way. You can easily just put, um, create three lists of words. One are the, are the red ones, which are bigger concepts, abstract nouns, uh, and then the blue ones, which are smaller, humbler, concrete nouns, and the adjectives in the middle, pick one, have, uh, and, and, and students have often never really thought about this. Often, sometimes you don't even need to use the reds. If you have a different type of poetry workshop uh, and a kid says, um, all I wanted was her love. And you go, oh, why don't you turn that into a metaphor? Why don't you turn her love into a metaphor? You don't need the red because the red is her love. All I wanted was the... All I want, wanted was the silent junkyard of her love. All I wanted was the quixotic insult of her love. And that's when you often have a kid say, wait, do I have to use that? Because I think I found something better. So mm. you don't have to use this. If this gave you an idea for something better, by all means do that. And now 
I think maybe Renee is going to put you in other in a group just to sort of compare notes and say goodbye to each other. Um, Renee, is there anything I have to do? Because I, I mean, Renee, anything uh, you need, you think you want me to do? Because I have to go be a father again. Taylor, Taylor, we're gonna we're gonna let you go. Renee Thank goes. you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. See you later, guys. Um, Thank you. So maybe here at the end, we ran out of time for the small groups, but maybe here at the end, we have a few minutes and people can just make any comments they want to make about what just happened. That was fun. My small group. <laughs> I, I could share something. I've been teaching poetry for many, many years. And um, I uh, also been dealing with, I've taught creative writing to people who hate school and hate writing for many years also. And it's amazing. I love doing it, but it's very challenging. And one of the most profound things that I've learned that is essential, that really blows kids' minds when they get it, is understanding the difference between concrete things and abstract mm -hmm. things. It sounds so basic, but you could spend your whole life studying that because just understand the particular and the general, the, the big, the small, those kinds of things. And for example, I have this thing unpacking and I tell them unpack love. So you open up the suitcase and there's love in there, but we don't know what love is. So show us with these concrete things that you can smell, taste, you know, the five senses. And doing those exercises, it breaks kids' brains at first because a lot of times we're not, kids don't learn and adults don't know that either, many, many adults. But breaking through that and understanding that, suddenly you get kids that are calling me when they're 26 years old, this is look what I just wrote. You know, and these are kids that didn't write before. So like, I think that if there's, there's a lot of mileage in just, t and there's equations, right? Concrete plus abstract equals figurative language or concrete plus concrete can equal figurative language. Just breaking things together that don't belong together. So like I really, you could spend weeks on that and it's also something you can do in one lesson like we just did. So I, I just love that I couldn't talk enough about it. So I highly recommend concrete and abstract and try to figure it out. Thank you. Anyone else? Ahead, Alex. Thoughts, caveats. Uh, Alex, jump I think, in. I think it's good to be reminded um, that when you give students e even a small task, and say, don't worry about it. Just come up with something. It's going to be fine. No, no pressure. Uh, <laughs> if I'm told that as an adult, uh, I still feel pressure and still like start to sweat when we've got two minutes left. It's always it's always helpful to be reminded that regardless of what you say, that kind of context uh, for some students especially is going to be uh, very pressure packed. Mm -hmm. So there, there was a teacher uh, who used to teach in my school. And this just goes into the unpacking that everyone was kind of talking about. You know, he'd say like, what's a theme? And a student would usually go like friendship. And he'd say, well, that's a ship. We have to take apart the ship. Like what's on the ship, take everything off the ship. Um, so it's just, I think, to connect it back what other people were saying. It's a similar exercise to, um, you know, Gianni Rodari, the Italian, uh, journalist who was also a teacher and he had a he used to have kids write to a fantastic binomial his he just would pick two uh nouns usually that didn't um belong together um like it could be broccoli and wedding dress you could do that and kids would make a title out of that and his idea was that it would just those unexpected nouns would jostle the mind out of the expected, the ordinary sort of, like if you, if the title was The Witch in the Pink Castle, you're not gonna get such an unusual story as uh, something was, uh, you know, the broccoli and the wedding dress. You're gonna end up with something uh, more off the track, but it's a similar idea. Excellent. So many ideas I'm stealing. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, thank you all. And thank you, live stream audience. We can now say that. That's very exciting. <laughs> uh, for uh, coming to this class. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. You learned something. Uh, you feel better. 
keep up your good work all um, our hearts are with you